Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nader Gerges. Uh, I'm an adjunct uh, art professor at San Bernardino Valley College. And I'm really pleased, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Yusuf Rawid. Uh, Dr. Yusuf Rawid uh, was born in Cairo, Egypt in 1975. He holds a BA, MA, and PhD in art education from Helwan University, Cairo, where he's been teaching since 1998. Till this day at the Department of Drawing and Painting. Uh, he's a, he works also as adjunct art professor uh, at the Department of Art in the American University in Cairo since 2006 until today. Uh, he taught uh, courses in experimental comics, drawing, painting, illustration, foundations of uh, two-dimensional design and uh, analog and digital practice in art. In addition to uh, the academic career, he has been a freelance illustrator for several uh, 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 national and international publishing houses since 1996, including Person, Cambridge, Longman publications. Uh, he held several solo exhibitions and uh, practiced in national and international exhibitions as uh, he participated, sorry, in national and international ex exhibitions as well as the Biennale since 1995. His work ranges from painting, sequential drawing, and digital interactive illustrations. You can check out his art at his website. He already uh, sent a chat. You're gonna find the website link for Dr. Yusuf in the chat. He has been a, a member of jury panel for several art and media festivals and exhibitions since 2008. Um, he organized the first of its kind academic workshop for experimental comic strips and sequential art in Egypt uh, and Middle East uh, for the duration of one month every summer between 2003 and 2010 at the Faculty of Art Education. But uh, from his academic and visual arts career, he is now working on his educational YouTube channel. And you're gonna find the link for the YouTube channel for Dr. Raghib on the chat too. And that's all what I have about him. So it's now up to you, Dr. Raghib. Thank you, Nada. thank you. Um... Let me just share my screen to start with. Uh, okay, um, is my screen visible at the moment? The uh, the slideshow is on, right? Yep. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mandy and Dr. Nether for the gracious invitation. Um, it is a pleasure, really, to be here with you, and I'm really excited about it. And I would like to congratulate Nether <laughs> on really making it over there. We've known each other for. 27 years and he is one of the most resilient and kindest people I've ever known. In addition to being um, a really great art teacher who can teach actually anything that he puts his mind to, anything that has to do with art, just tell another about it, he'll study it and teach it. He's very good at that. So it's, it's been a pleasure knowing him for 27 years. So thank you very much, Mandy, and thank you very much, Nether, for the uh, invitation. Um, as a teacher and an academic, I believe that breaking down the process that goes into creating art is very important for me and my students because I get to share what I discovered and how I discovered it. And maybe some of them would find my research-based approach suitable for the type of art they might want to create. And this presentation is a breakdown of the research that went into making one of my solo shows and how the concept-driven visual narratives were formulated. The process is a mixture of deliberate research, sheer coincidence, and integrating um, 
personal history and subjective ideas, of course. Um, I would like to read to you, apart from my artist statement for the solo show, Smells Like Teen Spirit, which is more of a parallel nar narrative to the visual iconography in the show. The crowds melted as Marilyn's sensual voice recited the words, the proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. Eyes bulged as Monroe straddled the Mariner II space probe. Finally, the Ubermensch shot his big rocket into deep space and boy, was it a spectacular bang. Now, he embraces the fallout, inhales the solar wind craves the mutation, basks in the afterglow of the nuclear winter. Catapult me into the man-made wormhole, he said. Consume us all in dark matter. And as Krypton crumbled on itself, he will see to the demise of Metropolis and the wiping of Gotham. Welcome to planet testosterone. That was a part of my artist statement, which is a bit like a hallucinatory introductory um, piece related to the works of themselves. My work in general is research-based, so I'm always to ha happy to, to share the process that went into creating the narrative because it also adds another dimension to the visuals because narrative um, work usually has a background story that is not complete, especially in visual arts, of course, because I'm also a comic strip artist. so. In comics, when I'm illustrating, I'm illustrating a very specific concept. But when it comes to visual art, the concept is general and it's, um, it's very subjective and it relates to the viewer. So having a background story would direct the viewer in a certain direction when it comes to thinking about the work. I will talk about selected pieces, of course, not the whole, um, the, not the whole exhibition, just to fit the time allowed. Um, Smells Like Teen Spirit is an examination of a never-ending rite of passage through a visual narrative that draws links between a Freudian view of puberty and a male dystopian metropolis, which interestingly enough seems to be stuck in a state of constant adolescence. So Borrowing from the iconic imagery of the teenage culture of baby boomers and Generation X, the analogy really shines. Obsession with guns, sex, drugs, aliens, particle colliders, and ideals, all the way to imperialist notions, hydrogen bombs, space races, and world domination. The world <laughs> has always been in the tight grip of a handful of bad boys boasting about their oversized plutonium driven manhood. So it was very easy to draw parallels between aspects of adolescence and the psychology of world leadership throughout the 20th century. You would be surprised how many times the world came to the brink of nuclear annihilation since the end of World War II. Can you take a guess? This is a question for everyone. Can you guess how many times the world was going to end with a nuclear war since the Second World War? More than we want to know. <laughs> More than we want to think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you will be surprised. Actually, eight times the world was going to end eight times from 1945 till the early 2000s. Let me tell you a little story. This is a picture of one of the handful of people who single-handedly saved the world from nuclear destruction. In 1983, Stanislav Petrov, the man in the picture, the duty officer at the Soviet Command Center for the Open um, Nuclear early warning system was faced with the warning system reporting that a missile had been launched from the United States, followed by five more. And <laughs> Petrov, for some reason, judged the reports to be a false alarm. And his decision to disobey orders against 
Soviet military protocols is credited with having prevented an erroneous retaliatory nuclear attack on the United States and its NATO allies that could have resulted in a large scale nuclear war. Investigation of course later confirmed that the Soviet satellite warning system had indeed malfunctioned. And the man passed away in 2017 and his life was actually portrayed in, in Kevin Costner's movie, The Man Who Saved the World. So humanity was going to end its own existence eight times in 75 years. And I believe if we ever had the means to do it earlier, we would have done it. So the main question here is why? I mean, sounds very counter evolutionary that a race in quest for survival would want to wipe out itself. So I did my research and through more research, I came to a conclusion that this chemical compound plays a big role in this dichotomy. Testosterone. And it's a very vital hormone responsible for determining sex and building muscle mass and bones in both males and females. Yet it seems to have a more sinister side to it. Sigmund Freud, interested as he was in human drives and instinct, instincts, um, talked about this dichotomy. Um, the eros being the force of life embodied in sex and the thanatos, the force of death embodied in aggression. And even though Freud never linked them directly to testosterone, the link is clear because testosterone is responsible for both sex and aggression in males. And both drives for life and death are important for survival. Sex for the propagation of the species and aggression for survival against whoever might want the race from propagating his genes. Want to stop, I'm sorry, stop the race from propagating his genes. And it seems really interesting that even in, in a biblical context, the first crime was a crime of aggression. One might argue that this was before any laws were constituted by, but um, that wouldn't be true according to biblical logic because Adam and Eve knew that they broke the law, the law when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this knowledge that they gained was passed on to their children in a biblical sense. So Cain knew that killing Abel was wrong, but he could not resist the impulse anyway. And now we know why. So it is most peculiar that the drive that keeps us alive is the same that might be the reason for our demise. And today we have the means to do that with the push of a button. So the first thing that jumped into mind while thinking about all that absurd aggression is, hey, this smells like teen spirit. And this is how I came to choose the title for the exhibition. And choosing the title first sounds weird, I know, but you can see that I approach my shows as if I'm writing a book or illustrating a comic strip or maybe writing a story or, an, or a novel. It's, um, it's, it's about the narrative and it's very literary to start with, that literary approach. So choosing titles and working with in, in terms of chapters more than really thinking about the aesthetics or of the theme at first. <clears throat> I was 16 when I first listened to that riff. I'm sure a lot of people here know Nirvana and Smells Like Teen Spirit. This is one of the songs that really changed my life. I got hooked ever since when I first listened to Kurt Cobain sing that song. I was already a big fan of heavy metal, but this was like nothing I ever heard before. It was real, it was visceral, and it spoke to me as a teenager. I ran because those were the days of 
tapes. I ran to the tape leaflet to read the lyrics because I couldn't make out what Cobain was saying. You know, when Cobain sings, it's really mumbled. You can't really tell what he's saying. So I read the lyrics and I did not understand a single word. Yeah, I was ever more fascinated because I couldn't understand what he was saying, but it felt like I actually understood everything he meant. It truly smelled like teen spirit, that vague, obscure view of life as a teenager. And even though Cobain always insisted that his lyrics didn't have a specific meaning, when I reread them again while preparing for the show, it suddenly made sense. It spoke not only of teenage angst and purposelessness, but echoed as well the behavior of the world of politics and politicians to be specific. Let me read lines from the song and think of me please of what it means in terms of today's world politics or world politics in general. That's a song that is supposed, according to its writer, that is supposed to have no meaning. Load up on guns, bring your friends. Okay, that sounds very interesting. Who does this better than politicians to load up on guns and bring their friends in? It's fun to lose and to pretend. Fun to lose and to pretend, rings a bell. She's overboard and self-assured. Oh no, I know a dirty word. With the lights out, it's less dangerous. Sounds very strange because how come it's less dangerous with the lights out unless you're already blind? So here we are now, entertain us. So who would entertain the politicians other than the masses, you know, the sweet tan puppets at most of the time? I feel stupid and contagious, okay? I do believe that line. Here we are now, entertain us. Who would entertain us? A mulatto, an albino, a mosquito, and my libido. This part, in my opinion, is the perfect description of world politics today. I'm worse at what I do best. And for this gift, I feel blessed. Our little group has always been, you know, like nations with nukes, and always will until the end when they finally decide to push the button. So the double entendre there just blew my mind. It's really funny when Kurt Cobain was talking about shooting the music video for Smells Like Teen Spirit, the kids in the video got so hyped up with the music, they destroyed the studio. You can find that video on, on YouTube where he talks about that. They actually demolished the studio. So this aggression that is mixed with pleasure is typical of the teenage spirit. Moving on to visual style, I worked as a professional illustrator for more than 15 years. And this deeply affected my approach to visual art since illustration can vary, I mean, illustrators, I'm sorry, can vary their styles um, frequently according to what they are commissioned to illustrate. So, this gave me the freedom to draw upon any style of drawing that would serve the concept in my work. Unlike um, a fine artist who is mostly committed to a certain style. So this gave me the freedom um, to work with styles that almost seem contradictory, contradictory at times. So here, for example, this is my work, my work from my um, 2018 Full Fathom 5 exhibition. And it was about um, the experience of my father passing away um, to, um, to prostate cancer. And the, the, the main theme was about that transformation from one state to another. And this is Smells Like Teen Spirit from 2019. And you can tell that there is a huge difference in style there. So, I use styles that serve the idea rather than commit to a certain style. The visual style of the pieces is designed to evoke certain ideas. Most of the foreground objects and figures are layered 
to hover over the background and move from one drawing to another despite the frame. So the visual style is inspired by several things. Um, one of which is the standees found in movie theaters where teenagers usually go to take pictures with their favorite superheroes, something that relates a lot to teen teenage culture. Second inspiration comes from butterfly display boxes where specimens of butterflies are pinned in a box to appear as if hovering. And in my, in my work, I'm collecting specimens of the ultimate toxic masculinity. So I found that there is an interesting visual parallel there. Another source is pop-up books, which relate more to children rather than teenagers, because teenage is that intermediate stage between childhood and adulthood. So the child part is not completely gone yet, even though the body is starting to mature. And finally, breaking the fourth wall in comics. And this is what inspired the characters moving between frames to create a dynamic feel and a continuous narrative between the drawings. Um, here, um, this is, uh, of course, a screenshot from the uh, famous Super Mario Brothers. Um, so there are influences that inspire, inspired style of specific pieces utilizing the aesthetic of the video games, others utilizing um, weapon blueprints, uh, popular how-to books and, and stuff of the sort. We will talk about them when we get to those pieces. As far as the concepts go, um, this is the key drawing in the exhibition and it is titled the Ubermensch or the Superman. It consists of four main visual elements. The iconic Superman emblem with the head of Friedrich Nietzsche, a radar diagram in the background, which is a symbol for surveillance, a blueprint drawing of the Blackbird. I've, I was always fascinated with the Blackbird because my uncle worked at Lockheed, which produced the, uh, the Blackbird. So I was always fascinated with that. I saw the pictures when I was a kid and I was always fascinated with the fastest jet in the world until this day, actually, even though it's decommissioned. So it was the most advanced reconnaissance aircraft during the Cold War. Um, and once it was like a top military secret and now it's decommissioned with its blueprints all over the internet. So it's very interesting how the top secret knowledge people once died to protect is public domain knowledge today. And finally, the T-Rex, the reigning predator that ruled the world in the Jurassic period by devouring everything that moves. The reason I chose Nietzsche for the head of the Superman is that I believe here presents the epitome of testosterone driven ideology. The very idea of Nietzsche's man being the intermediate stage between the Superman and animal puts regular Joes that abide by the values of society at a lower status than the Superman who makes his own values apart from society. And in doing that, according to Nietzsche, it is fine for the Superman to be selfish, aggressive, violent, and misunderstood by others. So I don't know about you, but this sounds like a typical teenager to me. Um, so Nietzsche's ideology that man is yet to evolve into Superman and to achieve that violence is permitted grab the attention of the Nazi regime. And that was through his sister who was in close contact with the Nazi party. And even though he refused the notion of the Aryan race being superior, Hitler found in the concept of the Superman a perfect analog to his vision of a new Germany and the rest is history. This ideology created monstrosities. Shown here is a picture of Dr. Dr. Kurt Blom, a Nazi scientist among many others who conducted horrific experiments on the effects of nerve gases like mustard gas, serene gas in, in Auschwitz. Injecting subjects with typhus, malaria, the plague, gangrene, 
to study their effects and come up with vaccines. So those experiments were conducted on concentration camp inmates, so of whom many were killed either during the experiments or afterwards. Blom was actually acquitted of all his crimes during the famous Nuremberg trials in exchange for the results of his experiments. And he even became an advisor on the American Chemical and Biological Warfare Program in 1947. So after his acquittal, he continued to practice medicine in West Germany and was active in politics as a member of the right-wing Germany party. And he even died in Dortmund peacefully in 1969. Blom wasn't the only Nazi scientist that was transferred to the US. In fact, 1,600 others in various fields were taken to the US in an operation known as Operation Paperclip to work on military projects. And another 2,200 were taken to the, by the Soviet Union to work on similar projects. Among those was another Nazi aerospace scientist, Werner von Braun who was the leading figure in the development of rocket technology in Nazi Germany. And he was the man behind the V2 rockets, by the way. And he worked with the United States Army on an intermediate range ballistic missile program. And he developed the rockets that launched the, uh, the first satellite, the, uh, the Explorer 1. Um, the main reason the whole space race started during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union had nothing to do with space exploration, but it was actually a, a race of arms where each country tried to create long range ballistic missiles that could carry nuclear warheads in case of an attack from the former allies, which is either the Soviet Union or the US. This led me to do some more research about the space race. And during that, I came across a very interesting chart that compares who has a bigger rocket, okay? The US or the Soviet Union. The minute I saw the chart, the idea struck me to call the painting Rocket Envy as a parallel to the famous controversial Freudian idea of penis envy. The, the chart was a great visual metaphor of, for how teenagers tend to compare their masculinity through the size of their manhood. So the drawing consists of the rocket comparison chart and a pitcher plant. Um, this is the pitcher plant here. It is actually a carnivorous plant that resembles female genitalia to a great extent, but in a more what, sinister alien-like manner. And it seems like the rockets here are racing towards the plant in some sort of sexualized frenzy where they will all be absorbed and digested by its fragrant juices because this is how it catches the insects. Um, the research led to more interesting fact about the relation between the space race and international espionage. With the launch of the Soviet probe Sputnik 1, the first space probe, um, ever in orbit around the Earth, it was declared that the age of space espionage had started. So the space probe races began again, not for the sake of space exploration, but rather for spying purposes. So apparently, we, the people, <laughs> nobody cares about us. It's basically about war most of the time. Um, reading about it on the NASA website, I came across a very interesting phrase that went as follows. Once probes could reach space, the two countries started sending probes to fly past the moon and other planets. So on December 14th, 1962, Mariner 2 flew past the planet Venus. And it said the following. It confirmed that Venus is very hot. The last phrase was so interesting to spark an idea and a title for the next drawing. I tried to think of who was the Venus of my early teen years, who could be described as very hot. The funny thing is the only one I could think of was Jessica Rabbit from the animated live action movie, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Who obviously wasn't even human. 
Um, but she was designed to be a screaming sex symbol and in her own words in the movie, I'm just drawn that way. She was placed among all the famous Disney and Looney Tunes characters, you know, the cutesy characters, while trying to seduce Bob Hoskins there who plays a detective in a movie that leans more towards film noir rather than a kid's cartoon. I was 13 when I first saw that movie at a friend's house. And it was the first time to see a cartoon character like nothing I've ever seen before. I chose that damsel in distress pose where the villain, that, that's, a, that's from a scene at the end of the movie where the villain ties her up to the railroad track, but this time she is tied to the space probe instead, waiting for her testosterone driven hero to come and save the world, save the day. Um, but that's actually Roger Rabbit who is the wimpy character in the movie and he ends up being the hero anyway to her. So, um, the next one, the next image there is ASL, um, which is the one behind me right here. Um, this is a drawing that is designed as a vertical comic strip, as you can see in, in, in the presentation, for two reasons, basically. One, for two technical reasons. One is that reading a sequence from top to bottom is international. You don't have to guess if the narrative is going from right to left or left to right according to the way you read your language being um, English or Arabic in my case. The second reason is that all three panels are visually linked through the tracking beam there uh, from the UFO. The first panel shows a 1950s style UFO um, you know, that stereotypical hovering uh, UFO over the woods scene and the star map in the background. And UFOs seem to be more of a Western culture thing um, coming from an Egyptian perspective. I can safely claim that superstitious as we Egyptians are, we never really had UFO sightings in Egypt or anywhere in the region. And I'm not really sure if we would have known about the concept if, 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 um, if it wasn't for the American sci-fi movies. So I started digging deeper into the phenomenon and I came up with some very interesting findings. The peak of the UFO fascination was at the height of the Cold War in the 60s. And according to scholar Nathan Brownstone, the Mars attacks cards achieved their popularity at, a, at the very time when the Cuban Missile Crisis captured the headlines, the moment when the Cold War came closest to become radioactively hot. And that was when that a brutal sum zero game scenario for humanity to survive, the Martians must die, um, established a solid niche in Americana popular, popular culture. Um, the cards depicted explicit gore and implied sexual content. And the latter is particularly weird um, because why would Martians rape earth women unless we're not really referring to alien invaders from outer space, but rather from our own planet, right? Um, my uncle, again, I'm referring to my uncle a lot here, immigrated to the States uh, in the early 70s, and he was an engineer. And during his visits to Egypt in the 80s, he was all about UFOs and the nuclear terror. So I'm not into conspiracy theories, but apparently this popular culture was either a reflection of Western nuclear angus during the Cold War, or maybe a subtle way to mobilize the masses through popular culture in case of an impeding invasion from the Soviet Union. I'm not really sure about that, it's just a theory. And there were many comics about those three subjects, UFOs, the nuclear holocaust, and the spies among us. And you can see here, those are two images from those popular uh, either ads or um, comics. 
Um, the second panel shows a picture of a nuclear bomb with a world map in the background and the letters ASL written on the side of the bomb. The nuclear bomb in the picture is Fat Man, um, the one that was dropped on Nagasaki and ushered the end of the Second World War. The yield of this bomb was 21 kilotons and it killed 80,000 people on impact and 200,000 later from burns and radiation of related illnesses. This bomb is but a firecracker in comparison to the nukes we have today. We have weapons that have a yield of 50 megatons, not kilotons. Something as powerful as a big meteor hitting the earth at full force. Now multiply that by 15,000 nuclear warheads present today in nine countries. And you can imagine what happens to all of us if someone decides to push the button. As for the letters ASL written on the side of the bomb, I guess most people from my generation recognize those three letters. Yeah, you guys who lived through the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the, the internet age, when the internet relay chat rooms, also known as the IRC, became popular in the early mid 90s, um, people everywhere realized that the world has become, really become a small village, even though this wasn't anything remotely close to a Facebook back then. Yet, I remember the first time I logged onto an IRC room in 1993 or four um, at a friend's house. I was suddenly in contact with the world. And the first three letters everyone asked were ASL which was short for age, sex, and location. It felt like I was some sort of cyber astronaut moving through cyberspace. And it was the first time in my life to ask a person, where are you located in the world? So that was really interesting. There are two main reasons uh, why I use those three letters. First is that the nuclear terror doesn't really care about age, sex, or location. It will drop down on everyone anyway. The second reason is that the internet ushered the age of a completely different type of invasion. Today, Facebook and Google know about us through big data profiling more than we know about ourselves. Just think of something and you'll find the Facebook ad related to what you were thinking popping pop on your screen in the freakiest manner ever. The third panel that depicts a horror scene of alien-like robotic tentacles there attacking people is actually a panel from the comic book version of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. And the famous 19th century sci-fi novel about um, the alien invasion of Earth and in the novel, the aliens perish before being able to wipe out humans, not because we managed to kill them, but because they lack an acquired immunity like ours to earth microbes. The H.G. Wells was a student of Darwinism and ideas of natural selection. Is, um, you can actually see the or feel the, uh, the um, the effect or the, uh, the weight of Darwin's ideas uh, on, on how H.G. Wells approach, uh, approached that in his, in his uh, novel. He was also a direct student of Herbert Spencer. The problem is that when Herbert Spencer, they are the, the picture on the right, the one on the left is H.G. Um, Wells and the one on the right is Herbert Spencer. The problem is that when he decided to apply natural selection, and that is Herbert Spencer, to social structures, he came up with the concept of social Darwinism, whereby superior physical force shapes history. And he came up with the expression survival of the fittest, by the way. It's not, a, um, it's not Darwin who came up with that, but mainly uh, Herbert Spencer. Once again, 
Nazis found in social Darwinism the perfect justification for their atrocities. Also, the idea of invasion was a very common notion in the colonialist era in, of which Wells lived. So to me, this novel is a true link between science fiction and the notion of world domination. And I had to visually refer to it in my work. The only logical thing to tackle next was war itself. One of the most aggressive good guys in comics is the Punisher, who is not as kind as to let villains live like the good guys in the rest of the Marvel universe or even the DC universe. He's no Batman. Um, and the reason why I chose him is that he doesn't have any superpowers like any other anti-heroes of the likes of Deadpool or Lobo. Um, he has a background story as well that is very similar to Batman, but a very violent method in getting his revenge on criminals in pop culture. Another thing that made the Punisher even more interesting is the use of the famous Roman adage in the TV series, Civis Pacem Parabellum, which, which translates to, if you want peace, prepare for war. Weird and counterintuitive as it might sound, this phrase is a perfect analog for how global politics tend to solve problems. Um, apparently, this is an ideology that humans have adapted throughout history way before Herbert Spencer came up with social Darwinism. Since the phrase dates back to the military writings of the Roman general Publius Renatus in the fourth century AD. The head of the Punisher here is a cross section of a puppy with, of which of course opium is extracted. Um, this is a metaphor for me at least um, for the trance-like state trigger happy politicians might be in. It also reminds me of the space wormholes. Um, so this is why I added a drawing of the Starship USS Enterprise from the famous sci-fi of course show Star Trek. Um, interestingly enough, the name USS Enterprise in that sci-fi show comes from a long lineage of US Navy battleships from 19, I'm sorry, from 1775 till 1961. Um, and that was just a few years before Star Trek aired in 1966 to boldly go no, where no one has gone before with all the Machiavellian uh, political undertones of the phrase. Um, and, and speaking of Machiavelli's ideology, um, I turn to the next piece. Um, the drawing depicts acne, something that is definitely related to teenage culture and bothers a lot of teenagers throughout, of, of the, throughout the world and is mainly caused by hormonal changes in the body, testosterone being one of them. The problem with acne is that in severe cases, if you pop a zit the wrong way, it might leave a scar for life and your skin might take a very long time to recover. I merged the visual for acne with two more elements. Um, the first is, a, is a, a group of pictures of famous philosophers, political figures, consumer, consumer culture icons, um, celebrities who are considered consumer culture icons as well. Um, the second visual is um, taken from the Four Dummies instructional book series design. Um, the reason I linked ideologies with pimples is that they both affect people most at a young age. Um, I always had a problem with philosophy, really, because whatever mad, sorry, whatever mad, irrational idea you might have in, in your mind, you will probably find a philosophy to back it up there. And 
that was the case of Nietzsche and the Nazis. So it's not it's nothing it's nothing alien. This this already happens. Whenever you have a crazy idea, you probably have uh, a philosophy to back it up. And young people who get to be exposed to such ideologies at a young age with no proper guidance, hence the for dummies visual, tend to get hooked on them the most. And if you try to pop the philosophy zit later, you are sure to get scarred. And when I refer to teenagers here, I'm not just referring to regular adolescents. Uh, I'm also referring to adults who are stuck in intellectual adolescence. I think one should learn about philosophy, but follow none really. And unachievable as this might sound, at least one would be careful because certain ideas are more dangerous than weapons. For example, Che Guevara is a romantic symbol for defiance and revolution everywhere. But for someone who used to execute his officers with his own hands and document that in a cold, medically precise manner in his memoirs, one can't help but wonder what would have happened if someone like that came into power. And the supposedly stereotypical antagonist among those shown in the, in the, in the drawing there is Niccolo Machiavelli, who is known for his notorious ideas documented in the 16th century book, The Prince, on how deceit, conspiration, assassinations are among the tools of normal polit political methodology. Well, I'm glad at least someone is honest about it since everybody does it. And Machiavelli's ideology is, is but a mere reflection on politics throughout history from the brutality of the Roman Empire to the assassination of JFK. So I created um, that uh, narrative that actually um, deals with war and teenage at the same time. Um, this is uh, pent up, it's a small piece and um, I created a, uh, a video for that specific piece on my YouTube channel. I'm gonna play it to you right now. Um... Pent Up is a cutout drawing from my solo show, Smells Like Teen Spirit. The key phrase is, you will probably go blind or grow hairy palms. The medieval myth used to scare children from masturbation. The piece draws a relation between teenager obsession with sex and the authoritarian abuse of power driven by pure testosterone. Consisting of several cutouts laid on top of each other, an M4 Sherman, the most widely used tank in World War II, with its distinctive 75 millimeter gun, is used here as a phallic symbol for the power of teenage libido, as well as testosterone-driven military dominance with 50,000 tanks manufactured during the war. Yet it turned out to be a death trap in many cases. On top of it, another cutout drawing of an archaeopteryx skeleton, the oldest bird known to exist, and another of a modern-day pigeon, both metaphors for the fragility, yet the primal nature of teenage sexuality as well as the fragility of the world of politics. Because absolute power corrupts absolutely, one day you will go blind or grow hairy palms. Um, for more of those statement videos, you can check out the YouTube channel for, um, I've, I've done a couple of them so far. Finally, I always like to include a panoramic drawing installation in my shows as if it's um, the final battle scene in a superhero movie. Um, this is the Empire Strikes Back. Um, and the battle here includes all sorts of characters of modern and ancient myth uh, mythology. And of course, the title itself is taken from 
uh, a famous sci-fi uh, franchise in Star Wars. And um, those superheroes come from all cultures, actually. You've got Japanese robots and, and, uh, and superheroes from both the DC and the Marvel universe. Um, and in the abstract background, disassembled weapon diagrams of the two actual weapons of mass destruction, not the nuclear, nuclear ones. They're the Soviet AK-47 and the American M-16 assault rifles, both used by everyone else in the world because in the words of Pablis Rionatus, civis pacem parabellum. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank yes, you so are, much. <laughs> are you open to questions now, Yosef? Yes, yes, sure. Yeah. Do we have any from the audience? It was an incredible presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let me see. Uh, well, in the chat, you are you are amazing. That's <laughs> that's always <laughs> nice to hear. <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm really flattered. Thank you. Um, was awesome. Thank you. So a lot of accolades for yourself. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for attending and being here. And sorry for all the uh, Egyptian students and artists who wanted. This to be in Arabic. I'm so sorry for that, but it meant to be in English. I'm so sorry again. Maybe we can. I, I can add a, a tr an Arabic tr translation later on, and you know, like I Arabic believe, subtitles, and, and put it in. I believe they have to watch uh, uh, the video you did about this in your uh, exhibition. In yes. the ending exhibition. Yes. Ah, there, there is another artist talk in Arabic actually on, on the YouTube channel, and it's gonna be the same, I believe. Yes. And uh, if they need to get in con or would like to get in contact with you, your contact information or your. Uh, they can contact me through my website uh, or I can uh, drop in my email there. Um, I have one question. How do you get all of those different ideas and weave them together into a narrative? Um, well, the, the whole thing is about the research. Um, it's very interesting because usually I start with one idea and then one idea leads to another. So it's like working with hyperlinks, you know, you click on a link, you go to something else and it leads you to something else. And you know, those, um, those com comments on, on YouTube where I, I got here because of a specific video, of a specific other video. There's this like common uh, comment on, on YouTube. So it's like that. One idea starts and then I go to another and leads on to another. And especially that these days, I'm not just working with books. I, I actually uh, go online a lot and Google things a lot because it's much easier. So it's, it's very easy to hop, hop from one idea to another. Um, when you start reading something and you get a line in there with a hyperlink that moves you on to another idea. So it kind of rolls on. It's like a snowball. I have another question, Yusuf, actually here, sure. which is how you involve comic strips in everything you are doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's my passion there. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> I know. Been doing that for a long time, so I know this uh, from 1992, guys. So <laughs> I'm still asking the same question. <laughs> well, because um, I think that comics, if if you guys are familiar with the um, the uh, very famous book Understanding Comics, I was just talking to Ahmed Shah about it, and um, the the uh, Scott McCloud actually breaks down the vocabulary and the language yeah that one there are the, the <laughs> vocabulary and the language of comics and it's fascinated fascinating how a very simple idea of placing or juxtaposing one image beside the other can create a visual link let alone uh, a conceptual one so in in 
our type of visual culture and our type of visual art there, it's very important to create art that can actually provoke different reactions from your viewers. So if the pictures they are put placed there um, are non sequitur, they do not create a, a very specific link, the viewers create their own meaning according to their own backgrounds. So it's, it's very interesting how comics actually harness the power of the law of closure from the Gestalt. It's, it's, it's basically about that. It's, it's about how you perceive the, the space in between the panels, how your mind creates that link from one picture to another, creating meaning out of them. Uh, I have a question. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, um, what, what's really fascinating about uh, your projects, especially this expression, uh, and I'm crazy about it. <laughs> it's uh, it's you. how you use two different languages and make a kind of, if we can say, a metaphoric uh, dimensions, uh, give new meaning from two different meanings and make your own language inside it. And that's what make it wonderful. But in the same time, from my little readings about comics and comics history, it's the comics industry it's itself, it's used sometimes in the Cold War. Yes, and, and, and I remember I remember that from many documentaries. Yeah. And in the same time here in this project, you used Cold War also some of projects and uh, resources. So, um, why you don't think about about those this part about comics industry in Cold War here in this project? I mean, it's I found it. It's like came and go. You know, it's not. It's not. Right. It's not focusing. Yeah. Um, well, because I I did not want to re re reproduce um, images that are linked directly to the Cold War. I wanted to make my own Cold War comics like the one behind me there. So it's like, because I'm actually weaving bits of personal history into them. So I did not want to use the comic strips of the Cold War as they are, because parts of me are in there as well. I, 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 just, I just mentioned that because when, when during your lecture, I remembered one of amazing, uh, cartoons and comics, it was common in the United States in in, in middle of time, of, especially in Cuba uh, case, uh, about uh, the turtle, they use a turtle as an example or a symbol for how to hide from nuclear weapon when attack is coming. Is that uh, Robert yeah. Crumb? I think, uh, I'm not really sure. It might be Crumb's work uh, because Crumb was fascinated with the Cold War and and he, his work was the, actually the epitome of the neurosis related to the, the nuclear terror in, back in the 70s and late 60s and early 70s. I, I think that might be Crumb. I'm not really sure though. Yeah. I'll put it somewhere in between. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the most loving part in your presentation was putting all of these leaders for the world as crazy teenager that's really nice and uh, they they're they're not just political readers but leaders but even philosophers because if you just follow philosophy blindly whatever you follow blindly you're probably you know heading for a fall so you have to be very analytical very critical about what you read all the time um, so it's not just about the the political leaders but philosophy, uh, philosophers in, in, uh, and uh, consumer culture icons as well, because this is, this, this is the part that is visceral, mundane, and you, you just deal with the senses straight away. So people kind of follow it easier. Uh, it's easier to follow rather than philosophy, because of course, in order to, order to read something like uh, Thus Spake Zarathustra, that's a quite a big book, so no, not a lot of people would go through that. But you know, if if it's easier to watch a video of Cardi B, you know, 
and get just hooked on that as a as a as a consumer item. I just wanted to give a comment. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you for, um, my name's Letitia Hector. I'm the Dean of Arts and Humanities at Valley. And um, I was just really excited when Mandy shared um, that this was gonna take place. And I really appreciate you collaborating with our department thank and you. division and inviting your students. I just think that's a, an amazing opportunity to provide both ways. Um, yes, this same here as well, yes, definitely. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Now, was this recorded, Mandy, or any part of it? Okay, because I've already been receiving emails um, requesting a, a copy of it. We're, uh, we'll post it in the cloud and then download it and um, it'll be an MP4 file and then we'll go from there, so. Perfect, thanks. Alex, did you have a question, Alexandra? Oh, it's okay, no, I just had a, um, was, but it's fine, it's all good. <laughs> And uh, I have saved the chat. Uh, so, Yosef, I can send that to you if you've not saved it. Again, wonderful mm -hmm. comments. Um, it, it was an incredible presentation. We're so thankful you did it for us. And um, again, being able to have an international presence and audience, I think that this is just amazing to me. And I have to th Same thank here. you. Nader for setting this all up also. It's, it's his idea. I will do whatever I can to help and assist our department. Thank you. Any further questions? Um, I don't, jo Yosef, are you willing to hang around if anybody has a question? Yeah, sure, afterwards? sure, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yep. yeah, there is. there are some questions for you, Yosef, so in the chat room, so if you can. Look at it quickly. Um, okay. Um, oh, is there a specific way you find inspiration for your projects or do they just come naturally? That's a good question. It's very hard to tell. <laughs> Some of them come naturally because um, if you're, I'm not really sure if this is coming from an artist or an art student. If, if you're an artist, you probably know the answer for that. So if you're still an art student and you're still in search for a, a process, you will find out that art changes your view of life because it's not a job. It's, it's a way of perceiving life. So you always look for patterns everywhere. And there is this moment where the patterns just, patterns just click, you know, and an idea just pops up. Or you might have something that you've been thinking about um, from the beginning and you can, you can start doing that as a project. Um, so it's very hard to differentiate between having an idea and looking for one because yeah, they kind of pop up because you're looking at life and you're seeing those patterns and you're, you're questioning a lot of things all the time. And you're trying to be analytical, not for, you know, being pompous or something, but you're actually, this is how you look at life. You keep finding patterns all the time and it can become very annoying for people around you, you know, because he, you're always trying to shower them with your insights because you're so excited about it and not everybody really cares about that all the time. So, um, yeah, you, you, it's a way of seeing life and those patterns that appear, th this is where the, the, this is the moment where those uh, ideas just pop up. So in this case, do you use mind mapping a lot? <laughs> yes, I do a lot of research, including uh, brainstorming, mind mapping and, and sketching while doing that. Yes, I do, I do that a lot, yep. And I do encourage my students to do that as well especially when it comes to projects that are related to like conceptual projects. The, you have to get what's out there onto a piece of paper and organizing your ideas. So the thought process would be a lot smoother. So yeah, I do a lot of mind mapping, yes.
let me see if there anything else. Um, any other questions? Feel free to mute yourself. Any language is good. <laughs> We're okay. <laughs> yeah, guys, if you want to ask in Arabic, if there are, if there is like uh, uh, an audience here, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll translate into English. So. Jihan. <laughs> anyway, guys, I am happy and I am happy that I have seen all the names of all the people here in the conference. I am happy. I am really happy to have all of you here. Nader is thanking everyone. Uh, for being here. We are oh, too, because this is a, a wonderful opportunity for our students and uh, our faculty. So thank you. I will stop recording if you want to uh, you know, stay and answer questions. We've got the Zoom time, so that's not a problem. Sure. Uh, but I will stop recording right now.